Miller Center, to our uh, longstanding uh, audience members, friends, uh, supporters, uh, thank you all for coming. You know this place well. For those who are new to the Miller Center, uh, we've been a part of the University of Virginia for about uh, just over 40 years, and our focus is presidential history. Um, we have uh, a great relationship with the university. We share faculty with the College of Arts and Sciences, with the law school, uh, with the business school, and, and other units of the university. And we've worked on a number of cooperative programs. So we're really delighted today uh, to do this collaboration with the college and with the National Endowment for Humanities uh, on the Human Ties Conference celebrating the 50th anniversary uh, of the National Endowment. Um, so great thanks to, um, to the college, in particular to Ian Balcom, who's not here with us today. I know Ian's running around crazy, um, as well as um, Chad Weldon and Megan Moore, who have been so important in pulling this together, and um, in particular to Bro Adams uh, from the National Endowment for, for allowing us to partner on this, which is uh, the third event that we've done in collaboration with them. Um, I also want to note, uh, after this event today, John Bridgen, one of our guests, is going to be at Newcomb Hall Bookstore, I think, uh, signing copies of his new book, so uh, a quick promotional plug for John. This, uh, this panel today is also connected to a big project that we've been doing, and regular attendees at the Miller Center have seen this, uh, or parts of it, over the year. Um, it's our first year project. Given our deep uh, understanding of presidential history and our scholarship in presidential studies, uh, and with a new president starting in January, whether it's uh, President Trump or President Clinton, we saw it as a service to the nation and a use of our scholarship to inform the incoming administration about what has happened in previous presidential first years. Uh, and they're extraordinary. They come with a paradox, which is you're at the height of your power, you've come in with a mandate, but you're at the depth of your experience working as a team uh, in trying to put together a team, pursue priorities, and accomplish the legislative agenda. And then things happen to you as well. So what we want to do is show you a short promo film about the first year project so that you can situate yourself in today's conversation. And then Barbara Perry, who heads presidential studies, is going to lead this conversation. And the audience for this conversation is not only you, but the incoming transition teams. And right now, both um, Mr. Trump and Secretary Clinton have transition teams. We happen to have spoken with both of them yesterday. The head of, uh, of Hillary Clinton's transition was here yesterday, did an event with us at the law school and had a private conversation. We had our second conversation by telephone with the Trump transition, and we'll be briefing them in the weeks ahead. So this conversation will feed directly into those transition teams. And with that, we'll show this video and then start the conversation. Americans believe their government is broken. Congress is gridlocked. The two parties barely speak to one another. Partisan rancor spreads from Washington and infects the nation as a whole. But it has been so much worse. We can learn from two great presidents who faced life and death political crises, Thomas Jefferson and Abraham Lincoln. Each took over a country and a government far more divided than it is today. When Thomas Jefferson defeated John Adams in the bitter election of 1800, his inauguration marked the first peaceful transfer of power from one party to another, ever, in human history. But it could have ended very badly. Federalists, especially Alexander Hamilton, feared that Jefferson was an extreme radical who would abolish a strong central government. They feared his revolution of 1800 would turn bloody, as had the French Revolution that Jefferson had praised just a few years earlier. Jefferson's Republican allies in turn feared that the Federalists wanted to reestablish a monarchy. Jefferson's greatest achievement was to diffuse the hostility 
averting a constitutional crisis. But every difference of opinion is not a difference of principle, Jefferson said. We have called by different names brethren of the same principle. We are all Republicans. We are all Federalists. Abraham Lincoln had the worst first year ever. Seven states seceded from the Union before he even took office. Four more joined the Confederacy after he was sworn in. Division turned to war. The South feared Lincoln would immediately try to abolish slavery. But Lincoln's first year was not about ending slavery. It was about restoring the Union. He reached out to Democrats, pledging to work together to bring back the Southern states. We are not enemies, but friends, Lincoln said in his first inaugural address. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. What are the lessons that Lincoln and Jefferson offer today? For all the partisan bitterness in the Capitol, Jefferson and Lincoln both made it their priority to preserve the Union over their own political party's dominance. Jefferson was facing a constitutional crisis. Lincoln, the dissolution of the Union. The only way out for both was to put the country first. They are examples that many modern presidents have taken to heart as they reached across the political aisle to bring the country together. Without bipartisan support, Lyndon Johnson could not have passed the historic Civil Rights Act of 1964 nor could Ronald Reagan have pushed through his landmark tax plans of 1981, Bill Clinton have shepherded NAFTA, or George W. Bush won agreement on the No Child Left Behind Act. America's next president will inherit a bitterly divided nation. If the new president and Congress make the health of the union their priority, those divisions can be bridged and the nation healed. Well, thank you on that dramatic conclusion. Uh, let us begin. Uh, and I will also quote uh, President Kennedy famously said, and here at the University of Virginia, we like anyone who quotes Thomas Jefferson or cites Thomas Jefferson. So you probably know the famous uh, quote that President Kennedy gave uh, uh, welcoming the Nobel laureates to the White House for a state dinner. And he said this was the most amazing gathering of intellects at the White House, except for when Thomas Jefferson dined alone. Uh, so I would say that this panel by far surpasses uh, Tom, even Thomas Jefferson dining alone. It's, it's just an amazing gathering here today. Uh, in true uh, bipartisan fashion of, of the Miller Center. Uh, and that is, you, you have, of course, the biographies of, of these distinguished panelists with you today. Uh, but just to run through the uh, presidents that they represent, uh, former Attorney General uh, Ed Meese here to my uh, right, uh, of course, President Reagan, uh, Ken Yale, Dr. Ken Yale, Bush 41, uh, Elaine K. Mark, Bill Clinton, John Bridgeland, uh, Bush 43, and with Obama, uh, we have Melody Barnes. So we're, uh, we have pr five presidents represented and we have a short amount of time today. So what we want to do is talk particularly about the first years uh, in which our panelists uh, participated with these presidents. Uh, and I thought that we would begin particularly with the next phase that will happen for our two main presidential candidates this year. And that is that one of them will be elected and in a short period of time, we'll have to go from campaign mode <laughs> to governance mode. Uh, and all of our panelists here today worked with these presidents, their respective presidents, closely on domestic policy, so we're gonna focus on that. Uh, and if I could, I'd like to begin with uh, Ed Meese and, and ask about that period and, and having worked with Governor Reagan in California uh, and then being uh, named to uh, head up domestic policy for him in the White House, uh, how did you go from governing mode, coming to Washington, creating a presidency, uh, and making that transition from being a candidate to President of the United States, January 20th, 1981. Well, in, in uh, 1980, it was different than it is today. So let me just preface that by saying today, much more attention is given to the transition that you're describing uh, with the Congress with two steps. The first is about 10 years ago, they provided funding and resources to start the transition as soon as the conventions were over. 
And uh, in this uh, uh, particular uh, election cycle, they even provided funding and resources to uh, candidates if they achieved a certain level of possibility of becoming president. Uh, and so it's different today than it was. <clears throat> in our case, we allowed no one to even think about transition or moving beyond the campaign until election day because we wanted all the time, energy, and particularly their focus to be on winning the, the election. Otherwise, there's no purpose to a transition, obviously. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and so today, in, in a sense, I think the transitions have to be more careful so that they don't distract or uh, otherwise interfere with the campaign itself. Right. But in terms of how we did it, uh, the, the day after election, I was appointed as the director of the transition. And what we did was we set up uh, a transition that numbered, I think, well over a thousand people by the time we were through. But basically, there, there are three major things that have to be done. Uh, number one is starting the personnel process. A president will, will appoint about 4,000 people, but you, only about 300 of them are going to be appointed uh, more or less immediately over the first few months of, the, of that first year. And some have to be in place before you even start that first year. Uh, we were lucky to have the whole cabinet, with one exception because of some individual difficulties, but the whole cabinet already had their hearings in the Senate so that they could literally be confirmed on the first, day, uh, the second day of the, of the presidency mm -hmm. and, uh, and then be sworn in on, uh, on the morning of the 21st of January. Uh, and so uh, so that, that is very important. So personnel really, personnel is policy and the importance of personnel in the whole, policy, uh, whole process is important. Uh, secondly, uh, you have to work on the, the issue of, of, of policy, and that is getting your plans so the president understands uh, what uh, or the, uh, the staff and the other people understand, the cabinet particularly, uh, what the president's priorities are, but also planning the, the whole first year. We, we particularly concentrated on the first 180 days. That was the period of time between inauguration and when Congress takes its recess in August. <laughs> And we figured you need every one of those days to implement your ideas, but, but uh, th it's important, very important to have that planned out, and particularly the policy. One aspect of policy that uh, every new president should uh, remember is during the campaign, have somebody take down every promise you made and every position you took <laughs> so that you don't forget these because there are plenty of people out there who will remind you. <laughs> and, and then the third thing is, uh, is basically preparing the, the members of your team, uh, once they've been selected, to go in. And for that reason, you have teams. Uh, it's in this, uh, it, 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 we called it, I think, executive branch liaison. But you have teams going into every department and every agency and developing a book of uh, information on organization, staffing, uh, key issues, uh, problems that they will encounter upon taking office, those kinds of things. So that basically, the, the, the planning is important, attention to personnel is important, and even during the, tran uh, during the uh, transition period, uh, getting the concept of a team operation, a team management is very important. Yes, well, thank you. Uh, maybe to, to you actually encompass and embody this arc of change in, tr in transitions from the 1980-81 period uh, to President Obama. Uh, Melody Barnes uh, served on the transition team uh, for President Obama. So uh, any differences that you see or anything that you would want to add in, in the changes in those many decades? Sure. Um, a couple of things. I think General Meese captured it really well in terms of uh, foreshadowing the thinking that's happened around transition planning. Because if you think about it, that 87-day period between the election and the inauguration, you are doing essentially the world's largest M&A deal. I mean, when, in terms of the transfer that's taking place, in terms of a merger or acquisition. And in that period of time, there is so much that you have to wrap your arms around, and you tick through all of the things that we thought about. And as a result of that, we as a country think have recognized that and have fast forwarded and put in place resources to fast forward that process mm -hmm. so that transition teams can start earlier. We started our transition planning in the summer, probably around June or so, and part of my job was transition, pre-transition planning along with the campaign work that I was doing. So I worked very closely with John Podesta and the entire team who was doing the transition. 
and we broke into several teams thinking about policy, personnel. I was one of uh, three chairs of the agency review process and actually uh, working with those or starting to plan how we would work with those in the agency, in the Bush administration, by putting together templates for our teams to think about so they could go in and go in very, very quickly and do the work because of the appointment process, you wanted to prepare members of uh, the cabinet, those who would be nominated for their hearings and for that process as well as the sub-cabinet. And one of the things that makes, that drills this down for me in, in terms of its importance, I remember walking into the White House the day of the inauguration, you know, and everyone's so festive and out, you know, and there are lunches and parties, and I just remember being cold and very, very tired. <laughs> um, and I walked into the White House because the, the assistants to the president have to report that day. And making my way in and getting your ID, the worst ID picture you ever want to take, <laughs> um, making your way in, and literally the phones were ringing. And it drives in to the point that government never stops. So you have to be prepared for that. And when you're new, you know, it's like literally my phone is ringing and where is the bathroom? So everything that you have to do to be prepared for that. And I want to say that the Bush team was so generous with us and I know that came from the president that we were going to, they were going to work very closely with us so that we could prepare a very peaceful and easy transition, as easy as a transition can be. So I think that preparation and all the tools that are now put in place in terms of resources, but also in terms of preparation that we've learned over the years from other administrations, make transitions go as smoothly as they possibly can. Well, speaking of Bush 43 and that transition for, for Bush 43 coming in had the shortest period of time, no, right? Because, don't remind me. <laughs> <laughs> sorry to have gone there. I once did that at a Harvard Law School session uh, with Lawrence Tribe, and I brought up Bush v. Gore, and he said, oh, don't say it. Don't say those words. But it, indeed, you did have such a compressed time uh, to go from that uh, campaigning mode into governing. Uh, what special challenges, did, and we're not hoping that we have anything like that this time around, yeah. but you did have a unique situation Let there. me begin by saying, you know, the Florida recount was a divisive moment in the life of the country, and because of the Miller Center for Public Affairs, who had convened former presidents Ford and Carter and Lloyd Cutler and all these outstanding Americans that had come together on a bipartisan basis to envision how do we actually improve our federal, federal election system. Um, Phil Zellico, who ran the center at the time, came to see me within a couple of months after uh, the president took the oath. Uh, he was in the Oval Office briefing uh, with the former presidents. It was a great moment. You know, Melody talks about it. The perception is that the country's always divided. People, people don't get along. There's not cooperation across administrations. In my experience from the Clinton administration, people like Elaine and Bruce Reed and others who made our transition very easy and it was a very short window to to be effective and then you know our relationship with Melody the Obama administration tells a different story but because of the Miller Center um, we were able to not relitigate the Florida recount and congressional hearings for months there was a bill uh, helping America's vote uh, Americans vote that was passed in a bipartisan fashion by the Congress, and we embraced effectively the, the Miller Center plan, so I wanted to do a shout out to that. But one thing, I, everything General Meese and Mel just said, or I, I, I agree with uh, wholeheartedly, when you take these jobs, you know, I had taken Richard Neustadt, Presidential Power, and James Q. Wilson on American <laughs> government, and worked in the Congress for five years, and felt somewhat equipped to be director of the Domestic Policy Council, but the first thing I did was call Joe Califano, from the Johnson administration and Ted Sorensen who had a larger job in the Kennedy administration and Roger Porter in the Bush administration and Bruce Reed and others to get their advice and one thing you discover is I'm so glad the Miller Center is doing what it's doing because there isn't the institutional memory that's brought to bear for domestic policy advisors to actually train us and equip us to do an effective job the Partnership for Public Service is trying to do so. Uh, uh, one thing I would add that was a, an insight, um, uh, we set three priorities, education reform, economic package, and compassion faith-based agenda. And we invited Senator Kennedy and Congressman Miller down to Crawford, Texas, to the ranch with Congressman Boehner and Senator Gregg, who were the heads of the relevant committees for No Child Left Behind. And we just listened. 
And Senator Kennedy spoke so movingly about he cared about kids in poverty. He wanted disaggregated data. He wanted to understand what the gaps were between black and white and low income and higher income kids. And because we brought them into the process during the transition, and we actually wrote the bill during the transition in a cooperative fashion with these leaders, a year later, it was signed into law. And so that, you know, we had a lot of failures, <laughs> a lot of things that didn't go well, but that was an example of something that um, we began by listening. We built trust and relationships with people on both sides, and we had a bill that reflected a bipartisan consensus. Well, Ken and Elaine, uh, can we get your presidents into office? Let's move beyond the transition at, at this point. Um, and, and Elaine, if, if you wouldn't mind talking about uh, a, maybe something similar to what John is describing, a, a summit, if you will, um, before the president comes in. I'm thinking about the economic summit mm -hmm. uh, in, in Little Rock uh, before President Clinton even arrived in Washington to become president. Um, and I, I wondered if you might also uh, sort of compare and contrast that with uh, getting into the prioritization of, of policies for the president, whether that's based on uh, a promise made or three very specific uh, policies that uh, Bush 43 had in mind or that uh, Ronald Reagan had in mind. I'm thinking of the gays in the military uh, mm -hmm. issue that sort of rose to the top suddenly as the president came into office. So I wonder if you could talk about those two elements of, of the first year of, of the Bill Clinton presidency. Sure. The... Um well, it was kind of odd in a way, now I look back at it, which is that um, Clinton was down there in Little Rock, in, holed up in the governor's mansion with Hillary and Al Gore, um, both of whom had their agendas and both of whom were, were very powerful influences on the president. And so they were doing the typical transition work of putting together a team, et cetera. And in the middle of this, they decide that they have to have an economic summit um, <laughs> which, you know, now I'm, I, it's funny you should say that because I'm looking back on this and I'm thinking, what on earth were they thinking? But they have this huge economic summit in Little Rock. Do you know where that came from? From no. of the th Among I, the three? I, I, that's, that's what's interesting. I think it came from Bill. Okay, I think it came from Bill, who, remember, was very young and fairly hyperactive, okay? <laughs> and so he, he just, and, and, and Al kind of went along with this. He was also a, a young, very young. And yes. maybe hyperactive. Yes, yeah, they were very young men and <laughs> filled with energy, et cetera. And the 92 campaign had been run on, it's the economy stupid. That's what was, that's, you know, was up in all the rooms and all the campaigns. And I think they felt that they needed to address it immediately. The irony was <laughs> that as in most campaigns, or as in many campaigns, there wasn't met much flesh on the bones. So one of the reasons to do that was to in fact gather a lot of people in before he was president and figure out what the ideas were out there for, for actually doing that. As it worked out, and I think you've seen this in some of the histories written, um, the creation of the National Economic Council ended up being the primary driver and in fact eclipsed a lot of domestic policy in at least the first term of the Clinton administration. And that invention of Clinton's, the National Economic Council, really became the most important Council in the White House on, on the domestic side, um, prompting James Carville to quip, when I come back, I want to be reincarnated as the bond market. <laughs> yeah. uh, because the whole attention was in a kind of fiscal monetary sense, and um, this was done with great, um, lots of controversy at, fr at first, the president's budget was. but. They did take a page from the Reagan administration, and um, presidents, speaking forward, presidents are well advised to remember this. You do the hard things early, because, especially on economics, because the timelines are such that they don't kick in right away, and you need them to be kicking in by the time of your reelect. So 
President Reagan had, I, I, I know firsthand, because I was working for Walter Mondale in 1984, <laughs> and, you know, we were running against a very hot economy, a very morning in America economy. And then fast forward to 1996, and Clinton had done the hard things on the budget early on, and by 1996, Bill Clinton, we were running in a very hot economy, you know, extremely low unemployment, et cetera. We were able to downsize the government significantly, and it had no impact on anything because the people were going out into a, a great job market. So um, I think that that lesson for the future about if you're going to take an, if you're going to take some economic moves, whether it's to halt inflation, wh whatever it is, you got to do that really, really early. Otherwise, you don't have time for it to show up um, in the economy. So part of the reason, Elaine, for doing that would be to have it, as you say, kick in by the reelect mm -hmm. go around within three to four years. Uh, is there another reason, and do I remember a, a quote from you that pointed uh, the president uh, to say, do the hard economic choices up front, try to get those through Congress uh, in part because of a honeymoon period that, that sure. you might have. So there would be two reasons then that, to try to do that hard work up front on the right. economy. That's the mythology that is turned out to be true of the first hundred days. I mean, and each president kind of gets this and chooses. So, so President Obama chose health care over um, environmental questions over climate change. I mean, that was the focus, and he got it, mm -hmm. you know, and it's not clear, you know, and who knows, maybe he would have gotten climate change, I don't know, but, but you know, every president <coughs> basically ends up having to pick something to use their political capital on, mm -hmm. and um, that's what <laughs> Bill Clinton did. He chose to really focus on the economy, and that 1993 budget deal was critical. So another, you know, people say all the time, oh, these candidates make all these promises and then they never do anything and they never follow through and it's all politics. We've just named several instances here where all of these presidents had a, a main topic of his campaign, mm -hmm. uh, went for it in the first 100 to 180 days and got it done. Just FYI to the public. <laughs> well, Ken, um, am, am I correct in, in remembering that uh, President Bush 41 recreated the Domestic Policy Council and, and put you at the head of it? Mm -hmm. um, what had happened to that council? Uh, wh where had it gone? Uh, what caused him in coming into office to, to recreate it or reinstate it? Um, and what was that like to head that up? Well, it was really great, um, and in fact, uh, the Domestic Policy Council had been created originally by uh, President Reagan, and um, I remember, you know, my first day in the White House, sitting down with a gentleman by the name of Ralph Bledsoe, who was um, running the Domestic Policy Council at the time, and I was, you know, just off the hill. I had, you know, just helped, you know, with the policy process up on the hill, mm -hmm. and prior to that, had spent just a few months doing some lobbying. So I. I thought I knew what I was getting myself into, right? <laughs> and when Ralph showed me the briefing book that you talked about, and I opened it, and I just, it was like page after page after page, this issue, that issue, that issue, still on the table for the Domestic Policy Council. And he said, now you have to decide what to do with all these issues. And so I was at first awed. I mean, it's just, it just, you just, wow, this is something. You guys are doing a heck of a lot. And then I was very quickly overwhelmed <laughs> because it was just way too much to do. And back to your point, had to pick and choose among the issues. The first issues that we decided were uh, the environment and disabilities, Americans with Disabilities Act. And um, the other interesting thing is that the way we constructed the Domestic Policy Council was actually different from Reagan. The Reagan administration was under the policy arm of the Office of Policy Development. In, our, in, in the um, Bush administration, the president really wanted to you know, kind of chart his own direction. Mm -hmm. He understood there was a, a really good foundation of policy already there. It was the first time in I don't know how many years that a, a sitting vice president became president. So on since the one Martin Van Buren. Since Martin Van Buren. <laughs> at least 60 years before, right? Yes, but, exactly. <laughs> but, can't do <laughs> but, um, so the interesting thing is you don't want to offend the people that are there that, mm -hmm. and in every transition, um, everybody's asked to, to tender their letter of resignation, right? And so you don't know if you're going to be back or not, and most of the Reagan people didn't because President Bush wanted to have his, his own people in there. Many of them did. 
But, and so you don't want to offend people in the same party, but by the same token, you want to strike out on your own direction. So he actually structured it a little different. Instead of under the policy, Office of Policy Development, he actually put the Domestic Policy Council under the Cabinet Council, the Secretary of the Cabinet. And that was actually key because President Bush had seen how, in some ways, the, policy, the Domestic Policy Council had been a driver of policy, kind of um, top down in the previous administration. No, nothing wrong with that necessarily. <laughs> but uh, President Bush wanted to have a much larger collegial um, collaborative process. And so he put it under the Office of Cabinet Affairs because that allowed the cabinet members to bring issues to us that they wouldn't have otherwise done if they felt you know, it was just going into a policy process in the White House that didn't include them. So it was very inclusive and resulted in, I remember the Clean Air Act, we started that um, day after the inauguration. And we had 12 cabinet meetings throughout 1989 to actually flesh that out. And we finally got it done by the end of the summer. The, then it went over to Ledge Affairs and the process started to collaborate with Congress and figure out how the, the new policies that had been announced in the campaign, brought through the transition, because what essentially, what's fascinating to me about the transition is the transition is a legal institution. It is actually a structure that allows for the peaceful transition from one administration to the other. Not many, I don't know of any country that really does it that way. And, and the people from the campaign lose their job on the election day, but then they come over the transition or the inaugural committee. So they have a job. And so they bring with them a body of knowledge and understanding with the policies that were developed and the promises made. And then, then we all just kind of show up in the White House. And it's kind of like the same people. And it's, it's collegial. And it's really uh, great because you see the same people and you go, oh, yeah, I need to know about health care. So I talk to Hans. I need to know about environmental issues. Talk to Nancy Maloli or um, um, Bob Grady because they were with me in, in, the, in the campaign and they know where all the you know, position papers are. And you can start structuring and creating the policy based on that, but also based on the budget and the exigencies of the current circumstances. So you really have to pick and choose, to your point about prioritization, you have to choose those issues that not only will, um, are based on the cam campaign promises, but also have a chance of moving forward. Right. You have to look at the low hanging fruit, you wanna get something done in the first 100, 100, 180 days, whatever. And so you really have to look at what's possible and likely to go through. So we focused on you know, Clean Air Act day one. It hadn't been uh, reauthorized in 13 years. Nobody thought it could be reauthorized. And the president said, I want to do this. Americans with Disabilities Act, he said, I want to do this. Okay, so we, we created a, a process, and so I, I divide the policy process into three things. There's process, how it operates, and you know, people have been critical, well, you know, President Bush, um, George Herbert Walker Bush, really want, wanted good managers. Not, he wasn't really an activist president. Well, I, I'm sorry, he was very activist, activist in terms of trying to figure out how to really manage the process well, get all the different opinions to the table, and then come up with something that he could collectively bring to the Hill and get it passed. And so we did, we did uh, Clean Air Act, we did Americans with Disabilities Act, we did a lot of, a lot of things during that first year. And the other thing that, um, that he was very adamant about is, you know, this is in the pre-decisional deliberative process of the president. And that's significant. That's a legal term that means it's under executive privilege. And so one of, the, one of the things I told my staff to do is don't talk to the press, don't talk to the media. Now, the downside of that is we didn't make a lot of you know, flashy <laughs> headlines and people didn't even know we were there in many cases. But we were there to serve the president, to serve the United States of America. And we were there to just figure out how to bring all the different opinions together and de develop it into a, a, a very good policy. Um, and then the political, so it's process, policy, and then the political, we just tried to stay away from <coughs> politicizing it too early. Right. Okay, we made a distinction. We said, okay, the political staff in the White House will be brought in at appropriate time. When we develop the policy, give the decision papers to the president to make his choice, final choices if we can't come to agreement. And that was always a very interesting process, and I have stories around that, but I'm going to go there right now. <laughs> so, so, so it was really a matter of, you know, if you want to then put the political spin on it later, that's fine. But let's get to the policy first, to the real foundations of, and the principles that we want to go forward with and get passed in the legislation and do something that's, that's really beneficial for the country. Right. Well, I, I thought at, at the end of our session today, <laughs> we'll talk about uh, crises that hit in that first yeah. year. But, but before we get to that, uh, I mentioned gays in the military. Are there examples that you can think of short of a crisis, uh, might have created a domestic policy crisis, but short of a crisis pushing the agenda 
uh, were there examples of issues that, that the, perhaps the candidate had not talked about during the campaign or didn't want to prioritize, but that were forced upon uh, the White House and the new president? Well, Mr. Reese. One, one occasion uh, that caused the president to get involved personally was the professional air traffic controller's strike. Yes. Now, this was not really a policy issue. It was really a matter of the president acting to carry out what the law was. So it's not exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. But I, I think one thing that, uh, uh, that did come up as a policy issue uh, was the whole dealing with the problem of, of AIDS, which uh, hit the country at that time. Mm -hmm. Now, we, we were a little bit different than, than your uh, policy council, which was essentially a White House staff. Mm -hmm. uh, we had the councils. Ronald Reagan really believed, as because of his governor's experience, that he wanted the cabinet to be the decision makers, the, the principal advisors to him. Mm -hmm. uh, he remembered back at, to the Nixon administration where everything had to go through Halderman, Ehrlichman, or Kissinger, and there was a sense on the cabinet of being left out. <clears throat> and so what he did, instead of having staffers be on the, uh, in these councils, he had the cabinet members actually be the councils. Mm -hmm. And so he created this idea of cabinet councils. You can't have the cabinet as a whole deciding every issue or having a, a say in every issue. So he created, in the first term, seven or eight uh, cabinet councils, which is a portion of the cabinet less than the whole. And he would meet with them on a regular basis. And then so that the, his time was well used, he had a, a preparatory meeting where the cabinet council was, was uh, chaired by a pro, chairman pro tem which would be one of the members of the cabinet. And they would develop for the cabinet meeting with the president then the idea, so they all agreed on the facts. So they weren't sitting in front of the president argue, uh, <laughs> arguing about what the facts were of a particular issue. Uh, secondly, uh, to provide the options for him so that he had at least a uh, start at decision making there. And then thirdly, uh, any other information and facts that were necessary for him to make the decision. Then, the, then the, that would go to the cabinet meeting. Uh, but it already, you had the cabinet members on board, and uh, he felt that, that the team management approach of having the cabinet rather than, than the staff. Now, obviously, the White House staff was a, a great participant, and uh, you're correct that we, we had a combination of, of uh, the Office of, of uh, uh, Planning, Office of uh, Policy Development, uh, and the cabinet office actually worked together, where the cabinet office would do things like the agenda and the administrative work for the cabinet and the Office of Policy Development would provide the executive uh, secretaries of each of the of the of the uh, poli <coughs> of the uh, policy councils and uh, I think as a result no member of the cabinet would go longer than at the most uh, two weeks or at the most three weeks that the president was out of the country or out of town mm -hmm. without being in a meeting with the president so that it was this close relationship that I think, and I was reading some of the materials you people were kind enough to send me about what happened then, the uh, outside uh, evaluations, and they talked about the uh, maximum of cooperation between the different cabinet members, which was a part of this cabinet council's process. Right, and then that also goes to the original point that you made that this, of staffing, of getting those cabinet members, if the president's going to be using the, the cabinet in such a crucial way for policy making, important to have the cabinet in place. Uh, as he walks in the door. John? We had a, uh, maybe a hybrid, hybrid structure. We had the Domestic Policy Council and then the National Economic Council and the National Security Council uh, serving the president, directly reporting to the president, briefing the president two to three times a week. But we discovered very quickly that our cabinet secretaries and the deputy secretaries were going to be representing the administration to the public and to the Congress on a lot of these initiatives. And they were going to be implementing. It was so interesting. In almost every, every policy briefing with President Bush, he would ask some version of the following four questions. And, you know, he had been to business school. He was very focused on results. On the campaign, we actually were charged with creating policies that not only had the speech and the narrative, how the president would talk, uh, the governor would talk about an issue, but the actual policy specifications the appropriations levels to fund the program, and then pay force, which is very controversial, but uh, developing a list of pay force to offset the increases in spending. Mm -hmm. 
And those things were you know, publicly known, and we, we published two books, and we took it. Maybe we were too nerdly and wonky, but we really <laughs> took it seriously. But the benefit of it was when we got to the transition and we got to implementation, we were able to uh, essentially have the playbook for the legislation or executive action. And there were a lot of instances where we had executive orders or presidential memorandums uh, to move our policy. But we learned quickly that we needed to integrate beyond the cabinet meetings, integrate the cabinet secretaries and the deputy secretaries into the policy process. And so I would regularly bring them in for the policy briefings. We'd, I'd regularly have lunch with them in the White House mess. I'd go over and see them and develop a relationship and then get to know their teams. Because President Bush wanted to know every time, what's the goal of this policy? What's the evidence? that it's actually effective. Third, who's going to implement it? And I'd say, well, the assistant secretary for you know, uh, uh, health and human services. No, 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 what's that person's name? And I want them to come in, and I, I, I want to get to know that person. He was very interested in management oversight. And then finally, how are we going to be accountable to the American people for results? And um, that shaped our policy lens in the White House in a very way, and it, it put the, direct, the president directly in the middle of making judgments with that architecture that I thought was very effective in terms of keeping us accountable, connecting us to the cabinet, and the other architecture in the White House, which of course is ledge affairs, communications, strategery, um, <laughs> and, and other, other and that components. we want to point out there really was a <laughs> there strategery, was strategery <laughs> committee <laughs> led by Karl Rove, as yes, I remember. right. <laughs> and then of course we had 9-11 emerge, which completely changes, changed my lens from domestic policy to domestic consequences and being in the situation room twice a day, um, um, you know, looking at domestic policy in an entirely new well, light. But, so before we move to that, I think, Elaine, did you want to say anything about, uh, again, the gays in the military policy and how that bubbled up to the top, perhaps not expe expectedly, on the part of the president? Well, I think, that, I think that a lot of presidents come in, particularly ones who are governors or, you know, and they don't have the, the big surprise to them is that the job of the president is really international and it's really military, okay? That's really what it is. I mean, if I were to, I, I'm sure some political scientist has done this, but just count the number of hours a day that the president spends on international affairs and military affairs. You know, education, there's a gazillion people competent to do education in the Congress, every place else. So the domestic policy is a much, it's a much bigger world, right? You've, you've got lots of, lots of cooks in that stew. Foreign policy, military policy is not. There's the need for classification, for secrecy, et cetera. So it's a little bit tighter world. And I think that President Clinton came in and just blundered into the gays in the military. Just simply blundered into it, not realizing, and remember this was, you know, what, 14 years ago, okay? So, um, just not, um, I'm sorry, just 24, 24 years ago. Years and yeah. Speaking right, of we math, like being, being we lost, a, we lost yeah. a decade, the, the lost decade. You even look a lost <laughs> decade, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, you know, the world was a different place. And he, I don't think President Clinton or his very young staff, most of which, who had, not, most of which had not served in the military, had any idea what was coming at them. And this was a surprise. It was a screw up. I mean, it was basically a surprise. Clinton had enough sense on the issue in general, 24 years ago, lots changed, that when, during the 92 campaign, when we did events with the, what we now call the LGBT community, which we didn't back then, there was no such thing, but when we did events with the gay community, Clinton did them at 11 o'clock at night. Okay, because again, different world, there were no, there were press deadlines. So all the gay events were done, we went to Human Rights Campaign Fund, et cetera, but after the press deadlines, okay? So he kind of kept that liaison, he was very clever, he, he kind of kept all the outreach we were doing to the gay community, and lesbian community, off the radar screen. And yet, in in terms of who we had involved in the campaign and who our allies were and who was part of our broad coalition, 
that was a very important part of the coalition. Mm -hmm. So I think he gets into the office and kind of forgets that and walks into this minefield. Mm -hmm. And it really was a minefield. And stepped uh, on some mines. Yeah, yeah, yeah stepped yeah. on some mines. Yeah. Again, what's remarkable is how much change there's been in that particular area in slightly less than a quarter of a century. Indeed, indeed. Yeah. Yes, a, a couple of things. One, you know, Elaine was talking about the fact that there were events that were done at 11 p.m. tonight, <laughs> at, at night. Yes. And you think about how social media right. has transformed you guys could that. could not have done this. <laughs> um, and the rapidity with, at which information is shared and what is shared. Mm -hmm. um, so that completely changes um, how you approach things and that's something that the next administration will have to think about even in a way that we did not. Right. And we certainly try to embrace that. I think it also shapes some of what uh, else we were talking about and how time is spent and how the pressure and the drive to move things has just continued to increase and increase and increase. And that shapes the way the president can spend his or her time. And I think we, like uh, in the way that Bridge described, the work of the council, um, in, the president spent time with members of the cabinet, had regular lunches, et cetera, but it was certainly incumbent upon me to work across the domestic policy agencies and departments and develop those relationships. And Arnie Duncan and I and others were literally on speed dial. I mean, you know, home numbers, cell numbers all the time because of those relationships. And you want those relationships because the worst thing you can have is a situation where you read about something that's happened at a department or agency the next day or online, as opposed to someone calling you and say, let me tell you the big, hairy, mm -hmm. ugly mess that is sitting over here right now. Mm. Yeah. So I, I think that that's <laughs> true. And you were also talking about emergencies, mm. and 9-11 will talk about, we walked into a, you know, the disaster that was an economy, you, which also you had shaped the transition. an ongoing crisis of, and, the, of the Great Recession. No. And, and precisely, and, and healthcare as a part that we were doing at the same time, so, and then there were the things that were surprises, H1N1, the shooting at Fort Hood, you know, all of these things that are surprises all the time. And I think that means a couple of things. One, advice I was given from past domestic policy advisors, put on the wall the things that you came there to accomplish and know that every single day you will be surprised by something. Mm -hmm. But you have to keep an eye on the things that you want to get done so that you can constantly move forward with that. Two, one of the things that the Recovery Act um, did was even though we knew we had to do that and there was, you know, a working with the previous administration on the economy as we came in, that you can use that crisis to try and move forward some of your agenda. And some of our reform agenda, we moved forward also recognizing what some of the economic parameters would be. But you also have to think about communications as you do that. And that's another important message for a new administration your narrative, what story you're going to tell. And it's one of the things the president talks about and said, we, we needed to have thought about that in a different way. We were just trying to blow through so many things because they were so hot and so critical. But how do you tell your story to the American public mm -hmm. and then layer on the, your, your priorities at the same time? Well, when you use the, the uh, intriguing phrase, big, hairy, ugly mess, Ken raised his hand. So I think <laughs> he, he, he has something to say about that. <laughs> But uh, I think relationships, you're absolutely right, you're absolutely key. But one of the things that, that you find out very quickly is that the White House is a fishbowl, is that you can see right into it and you can see everything that happens. And so relationships are key and, and important, but I would stress the process. Because if you don't have a credible sure. process absolutely that people say, oh, this is where I can take an issue, whether it's an emergency or if it's a long-term planning or whatever, you don't have that process, then people start you know, end running, they start, it's like, you know, if mom doesn't want it, I'll go to dad. If the chief of staff doesn't want it, I'll go to, you know. And so you have to have a credible process because, because I remember the time I was asked to assemble the Americans with Disability Act committee, the disability committee, subcommittee under the Domestic Policy Council. And I said, great. Um, and I was talking to a, a senior leader and one of the assistants to the president. And I said, well, you know, when do you want to do this? Gonna start now, maybe this week. Went to the staff person, the old executive office building. They, they, they had the meeting like on a Monday. All these people from the White, in the White House, because it was still in the White House, we didn't bring, yet bring in the, the other members from the department. They all came, they're all sitting around. Very next day I get a call from the Hill, Senator Kennedy's office. 
I heard you had a meeting. We, <laughs> we have a bill. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, and remember my staff was told, don't talk to the media. We're in the, in the internal process under executive Cone privilege. Cone of silence. Cone of silence. And so it wasn't me, it was other people. Okay, my, the next person who called was Dick Darman. <laughs> I heard you had a committee. What, what, what the heck? No, I won't go there. But he was really, he, and, and so I said, well, um, uh, you know, Mr. Director, it's, it, it's, and I told him the genesis and the president wanted to do this. He goes, oh, okay, well, next time, why don't you call me before you have the meeting? <laughs> well, I can't call everybody, but, but um, Bless his heart, Dick, Dick Darman. Uh, but um, you know, it, it is a fishbowl. You have to really have the relationships and the process. I, I, I can't stress that more important right. than anything else. And, and, have then, the, and have discipline within discipline that process. Discipline the process and the, go, look at the policy first and get all the opinions before you start layering over the, the politics, quite right. frankly. So when you think of discipline, you think of President Clinton, right? So, <laughs> Elaine yeah. was raising her hand. Uh, no, actually. <laughs> Very funny. Actually, what I was gonna what I was gonna say about that was that the White House is one of the few organizations in the country, maybe in the world, where the formal organization organization chart does not necessarily have anything to do with who has power. <laughs> okay, it really doesn't. And and people, especially corporate types, are always making the mistake of looking at that chart and saying, well, this should this person reports to this person. So there are always people in the White House who have modest titles who can walk into the Oval Office or can walk into the First Lady's office or can go into the, go into the residence, you know, at, at various times. And if you really want to understand the White House, you have to understand that there's a formal structure and then there's a very powerful informal mm -hmm. structure. And so the two, and the two are always kind of fighting with each other. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not as clean as it would, looks on, a, on an org chart. Very important point. Uh, Ed, could I come back to you to um, uh, Melody's point? We haven't really talked a lot about communication and about the, telling the story and telling the narrative. And I love from uh, the Reagan oral history, which you so kindly participated in, uh, that, that there are stories about uh, President Reagan wanting to know and, and Mike Deaver wanting to know, if you come to the president and you have a policy uh, and you have an event that you want to have around that policy to, to drive a narrative, uh, that Mike Deaver wanted to know, if you, if you come to me with that request, I want to know what is, what's the story? What's the, the story on that event the next day about that policy? What's the first paragraph? And what's the, the picture? Now, some of that is going to relate you know, for 30, 40 years ago about a different media where you cared about what was the lead story in the newspaper and what was the picture. But I do think that, that the same issue can apply even today as to how you use social media uh, and 24-7 media. But would you like to talk a little bit about that as you were planning policy? Were you taking part in the communications process or how those policies would be communicated to the people? Yeah, the whole role of communications was very much a part of the implementation plan yes. of any one of these policies. We've really talked about how do you get the policy, what are the steps up to the president making a decision. But from that point on, there had to be a, as you say, a procedure is very important. And so there was an implementation plan of how you did this. Sometimes it was something that Washington was not particularly interested in, uh, but it was very much uh, uh, in, ter in terms of the... Uh, the press there was not a hot topic, but it was very hot in Ohio or it was someplace else. So part of that would be working out the president taking a trip uh, to uh, uh, Detroit or to uh, Cincinnati or someplace, and that was a part of the implementation plan then to make sure that the people who were really going to be affected by this uh, had a part in learning what was going on. Right, so really taking <clears throat> it to the people, taking the story right. and the narrative to the people. And it was also a way, quite frankly, to get around uh, what might be a hostile uh, media in <laughs> ah, Washington ah. <laughs> and, and getting the people out there who are going to be affected by this yes. to uh, get that communication, which then comes all the way around back to their congressmen 
and they're members of, of uh, either the Senate or the right. House. And, and, and we, we've come full circle then to re-election. That, that obviously to get re-elected you have to have the people on your side. Well, we just have a few minutes left, but, but can we end with the, the topic of uh, what happens in that first year, maybe even the first months, uh, particularly if you come in with an ongoing crisis, but a crisis that you cannot anticipate, you cannot expect, happens in the first year. Um, anyone we had, want to? We had the crisis of all crises, of course, with the president getting shot. And, yes, yes. And, absolutely. Uh, and, and so, what what happens when, with your policy when the president goes down? Well, for one thing, the president there is not there to provide the leadership. Uh, so, you, and at the same time, you you have the, have the vulnerability of somebody else trying to step in and uh, push their own agenda or uh, uh, change, uh, elevate their own status. Some of us remember that, sort of that from, <laughs> and, uh, from certain people speaking on television. <laughs> And so uh, for that reason, that's where the prior planning, where the teamwork, teamwork management, and the personnel management, all the things we've been talking about here, all comes together. Right. And, and that was where, what happened there. And I was happy that everybody did their bit. For example, the first thing I did uh, was to get in touch with the uh, Attorney General to find out if the FBI had any indication that this was part of a, of a larger problem. Uh, and then to talk with the Secretary of Defense about is there any international implications? And he had raised the defense condition one notch just so people would be on the alert. I mean, but other people, uh, Dick, uh, Dick Allen, who was the uh, uh, National Security Advisor, uh, I was at the hospital actually, and he there brought the rest of the cabinet into the cabinet room if they would be necessary to follow the 25th Amendment. Mm. So it, it was the fact that there was a team spirit there and nobody tried to take advantage of the situation, but rather was cooperative. And I think that, that had a lot to do with it, so that the interpersonal relationships that we've all been talking about within the White House was a very important aspect of getting through that crisis. Yes, and then a, a, an outside attack, an attack on the homeland, 9-11. Yeah. Yeah. And the unexpected, I was in the President's Emergency Operations Center below the White House with the whole senior team uh, on 9-11. And I went over to Josh Bolton, who was our Deputy Chief of Staff for Policy, and I said, you know, what is FEMA doing? What is our response going to be? Our Secretary of Transportation was grounding every plane coming into the United States. Um, you know, a lot of the, the uh, national security infrastructure, Condi and the Vice President, the President were on the phone managing that as best they could. But I went over to FEMA and discovered, you, you get the unexpected, the entire FEMA team was out in Colorado having a conference on what if terrorists struck the United States. <laughs> and so I'm meeting with the chief of staff of FEMA and their senior team and a lot of civil servants, you know, we forget. We talk a lot about political appointees, that, but these people who serve for 10 and 20 and 30 years in government are sort of the mainstays uh, and give continuity to government in ways that sometimes we forget. And, it was so reassuring to see that the actually the, the um, emergency management architecture that FEMA had undertaken for natural disasters actually had high relevance to New York City and the Pentagon and this city we'd later learn is Shanksville. But, but also um, the, the president's job is to bring calm uh, to the country in time of crisis and uh, it's almost unthinkable now in today's divisive political climate, but six days after 9-11, President Bush went to a mosque and he met with um, Muslim leaders and he said Islam is a religion of peace. Um, within two weeks, we had uh, created um, a homeland security apparatus, to Ken's good point about you need structures, and Tom Ridge, a governor from Pennsylvania who the president knew well and was very effective, was brought in as the assistant to the president, reporting directly to the president for Homeland Security. And we created a whole apparatus. We worked with Joe Lieberman and others in the Congress to create a new Department of Homeland Security. Final thing we did was created a National Service Council. The appetite in the country was people wanted to come together to help. And so um, we created, until the Obama administration, the largest national service initiative since the CCC, which provided Americans millions of opportunities to serve their country and come together across uh, politics and, and uh, other lines. 
Well, <clears throat> unfortunately, we have come to the end of our hour, and you can see why I have the best job in the whole world, and that is d presidential oral history. We have done at the Miller Center oral histories of all of these presidencies, and all of our participants today have participated in them, including uh, a, a Ken Edward Kennedy oral history. Uh, so we want to thank you all for your service to our country and our nation in times of crisis particularly, but in, in good times as well, and for all that you've done for our country uh, in bi true bipartisan fashion here at the Miller Center. Thank you all for being here today, and let's give a round of applause. Well, my, my thanks to all of you, too, and my thanks to Barbara for leading such a great conversation. Um, I want to make a couple other quick thank yous. Thanks to Jeff Chittister and Tony Lucadamo and our policy program, who have been working for many months pulling this panel together and who are working with this material and with this group to get recommendations into the new transition teams. Um, thanks to two of our governing council members who I see here, the two Joes, uh, Joe Gladden and Joe Erdman, as well as Sally Gladman, who are here. Um, and I want to come back to a phrase uh, that Melody said, um, which is you want to put on your wall what you want to do and, and work every day to get it done. And in some ways, this panel is what we want to do at the Miller Center. Um, we want to connect our scholars to the living presidential history that still guides our country. And we want to work with the college and with other organizations and uh, partners here, both at the university and around the country, to help make that happen and to engage public audiences like yourselves. So thank you for being part of this. We're going to ask you to stay in your seats while our panelists go to a session that they have to do just after this.